I've got something rare that I was hoping would be fun and interesting for the martial arts geeks out there today. Uh, I have come upon an old seminar tape that was made for Karate Do students on the East Coast in 1991. So this is what karate looked like 30 years ago. Um, there's a lot to unpack here, and we can sort of take it apart a little bit based on what we now think of martial arts and what we now think as more people have branched out into other fields of study. Uh, first of all, uh, my credentials, of course, I am uh, 30 years of study in karate do and judo. I'm fourth degree black belt judo, second degree black belt in karate do, first degree black belt in kobudo, which is the style of weaponry that was used by this group. Uh, much less experience in jiu-jitsu, but first degree black belt in jiu-jitsu. I've done that for maybe 20 years at this point, and a lot of field and other things. Everybody that you see in here is mostly going to be experienced karate do professionals. Not professionals, practitioners. Um, and this is their association logo. This is the American Shorunu Karate Do Association. Uh, Shorunu was branched off from the Matsubayashi Ryu, and we can trace people all the way back to Gitsin Furukoshi. Um, Furukoshi Sensei, I think, did mostly Matsubayashi, but uh, all that stuff filtered down through people and through a bunch of uh, through a bunch of Westerners. Uh, eventually through the man that you can see back here, uh, that is Paul Keller Sensei. He was the founder of the association and seventh, possibly eighth degree. Uh, and one of the people that he studied through is the person that runs the local practice that these guys were working out of, which is the man back there, that is Jack Davis. Uh, he made at least 5th degree black belts and 3rd or 4th in Kobudo in weaponry. What they're doing right here is Sai Kata. So, you know, basically, anybody that watches Ninja Turtles growing up understands that you can use Sai as a weapon, but it's really hard to sort of imagine how. So unless you actually watch somebody practice, you know, that never really seems like something that you can use effectively as a weapon. It just doesn't look sensible. Uh, so what they're doing is trying to put in a, uh, you know, in a digestible format, a way to practice with the Psy. Because we had these forms, right? And you'll see them do this very, very slowly, because while those things are not super pointy, if you put your body into this, man, you can whack somebody. I also really like the 1990s quality of the uh, of the recording here. Uh, it is worth mentioning that, of course, I knew most of these people very personally. I trained with a majority of the people that were here at the time and much later. Paul Keller Sensei uh, was visiting. He was here for the seminar itself, but he was the head of the association. So he was here to sort of take in the stuff that, that was done at this area and uh, you know, and spread it out into other places. Give them other stuff that they could could work with. Uh, so what they're what these two men are doing? I'm actually going to pause this a little bit. Uh, is just sort of showing the stuff that they've been working on, getting it down on tape, putting some fighting sigh and fighting bow techniques in both a practical format where you can use it against another person, and practice it against somebody that's using a weapon against you. Uh, and secondarily to that, to put it in sort of this kata format, in this sort of just practice it on your own kind of format. The problem is that you'll see they're kind of just going through the moves, right? When they do this, there's not really any power into it, so they're stepping through the moves and they're practicing the movements, but they're not practicing it in the way that you would use it, right? His is a little more dynamic. You're seeing him really put some, some focus into the movements, right? Uh, but, uh, and this is not a slight against Tom. This is, we're inside. There's an eight foot ceiling here. They're holding a five foot stick. Both of these men are six feet tall, you know. You can hit the support pillar in the room, right? You can't just sort of go off with this bow. But it does affect the level of practice, right? So we wouldn't do this now. 2020, if you're gonna practice with the bow, you're gonna swing the bow. You're gonna attack, right? There's more focus here. Oddly enough, I drilled the hell out of all this stuff, and especially the bow. I was particularly a bow specialist when I was growing up. 
So it's actually really interesting to look at this done in its early stages, because we, we modified it a little bit later. I'm super amused at this, though. Yeah, they're trying to make sure they don't whack that. There's a light bulb that was hanging from the ceiling over here. They, they're worried about whacking the light bulb. Um, probably worth it to look back here. I'm trying to catch a good frame where you can see it. Uh, you can see there's a bunch of people's kids just kind of hanging out in geese in the background. And if you look behind this poor lady right here, there is a little blonde kid that is being really obnoxious to all of the other kids right here and just kind of being a brat. And yeah, you can definitely guess that is seven-year-old J-Boy. I'm I'm not really in the front. I'm behind that lady right there. Oh, that stance looked okay. Let me. I actually want to look at that again. He makes such a point of swinging through that that disarm. He swings through the disarm, and it's supposed to be one movement to go towards the leg. But he wants to throw the disarm. He doesn't want to clobber Tom in the leg really hard, which of course you would do clobber him in the leg and then since he had to move so awkwardly to get there he has to do this like hopping switch thing and can't really use his weight to do the final strike the the kidney attack yeah he does the best he can do with it it's just it looks a little awkward on video and like i said remember they're they're sort of putting a a limit to how much of this they actually want to put power into because they're inside right Nobody wants to swing and whack the ceiling or whack the support beams or whack any of these. Um, everybody's stances look weird from a modern standpoint, and a lot of Karatero's stuff okay, nowadays again, is more about stances. Uh, the, the, the big differentiation between Shorinru and other forms of Karatero that were around at the time, even, uh, like Shotokan, Gojuru, Ishinru, is that we were a lot more lax with our stances than, than they were at the time. And you can see it. These guys are just kind of standing on top of the ground. When they do their kata, when they do their forms, sometimes you'll see them really lock into a good stance. But uh, it's, it's not like Shotokan, where that reverse stance, you know, walking stance reverse punch, or even forward stance reverse punch, is just one solid brick, right? Shorunru, we're definitely more on top of the ground and finding other body position ways to gain power. Which, looking back at it, looks really weird to me, right? Everybody's stances look very odd. And that's just sort of a sign of the times. Karate in the East Coast in the 90s was very, very different than it is now. And there really were kind of separate groups. You know, there was, there was like New York that had a lot of Ishinru, a lot of basically Harlem, right? New York karate was scary. And I believe that was mostly Ishinru people. I did not directly encounter most of them because I was too young. And that had all changed. Whoa! 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 He shortcuts this really badly. Oh yeah, that's, that's gotta be parallel, right? If you if you hit something that's, that's like a wall and you hit it, you stop. If you hit something that's slanted at any length of, of speed, you you skid up it, right? That's never going to block. You're going to hit yourself right in the hand. Now, they're trying to shortcut it a little for demonstration purposes, but whoa! Sorry, what was I talking about? Oh, right. Uh, the, this association at least covered most of the east side of the country, I believe. Yeah, he did it again. You definitely got to get that block over there. And you don't want to block your own face, right? But you definitely want to have it over here because you have to have the bow vertical. It doesn't block if you don't have it vertical. Sorry, give me two seconds. I want to catch up on something I was thinking about. This association was definitely at least Massachusetts all the way down through, I want to say, Georgia, maybe even Florida, and over pretty much to the Mississippi. So I, I know it started in Ohio, but there's a lot of people, um, you know, just sort of north and southeast half of the country that were doing things with this association at the time. And uh, This kata was developed to capture many of Papa Joe's signature techniques. So we'll call this Papa Joe's Kata. Kumite Kata Goda. Yosuke. Uh, sorry, this is uh, John Andrews. He made at least fourth degree black belt. And uh, he says he was looking on to try and... Uh... His stances look somewhat better. Like, he's not just standing on the ground. He's kind of in the ground a little bit. Anyway, he made at least fourth degree black belt. He also studied quite a lot of uh, Yaido, drawing the sword and cutting with the sword uh, and so I did a lot of my sword work with him 
Uh, this is Pam DeLacy. She made at least second degree black belt, and I haven't talked to her or thought about her in 20 years until somebody showed me this tape. She was known as a kata specialist. She was very different than most of the people in this group. Almost all these guys were sparring specialists. And as a matter of fact, the instructor that John mentioned that he wanted to capture their signature techniques, uh, Papa Joe Hayes was a, a sparring and boxing teacher. Um, and was the fighting specialist in most of his students, which includes almost everybody in this room, were fighting specialists. If I remember properly, Pam's strength was in... She did a lot of good kata stuff and a lot of... So I'm looking at this bunkai and it's a little bit questionable. I see what he's going for, but they definitely don't remember what they were trying to accomplish with some of these things. So it looks a little sloppy in the execution. Not great for learning, but I guess since you have it on tape, you can take the time to sort of break it all down. But when I look at his individual traps and stuff, yeah, like that, that back up and trap kind of thing that he's doing and pull them past where they're going and then take them to pieces, I see pieces of the sparring that I saw from all these people, from from both of these men back here, from uh, from John, from the head instructors, um, it's very good as a fighting style. I, I think this explanation is quite poor, and I don't know why they didn't just reshoot it. They really should have just reshot it and not used this footage. Uh, I guess it was more expensive at the time to shoot footage, but this this footage is quite bad. Um, the stuff he's doing, that that kind of trapping block, it's not really mawashiuke, it's, it's uh, what's cover? I can't remember the word for it, the other type of blocking of, of covering. Um, but that, that was done a lot, even with gloves on you can do that. And you see more of that these days, whereas people have done a lot more study of things that they want to do. You know, for, for prize fighting, for UFC, for mixed martial arts type stuff. Wow. Her poor face. He just about clocked her in the face. And part of the problem here, of course, is that she's a 135 pound woman and this guy's 6 foot 200 pounds. She's given up 60 pounds to this dude, so of course nothing she does is going to move him. Aya. Um, I like the techniques that I'm looking at, but yeah, this, this footage is completely bad. Uh, I've also accidentally found a much better spot to pause it, so you can see my dumb face back there. That is definitely me at seven years old. Aren't I cute? I love this. I'm having a blast doing this. Um, yeah, she was she was a kata specialist. She definitely did some kata competition later in her uh, in her studies and was quite good at it. She also had a taekwondo background, so she was very very flexible, and you can see that in her stances and in her. Um, in her movements, that she's very strong in, in flexibility areas. All right, so this is the thing that I actually wanted to make fun of the most, because this is getting into my Judo area. always with two people. Sorry, I want to listen to her just for a second. To practice the actual throws, so we aren't going to do a demonstration with a single person practicing in the air. Right, this okay, so this a was a crash course in judo, right? So this was before the days where people that were strikers knew that they needed the to deal with some groundwork. This was before Hoist Gracie beat everybody to death on the ground, right? And showed that he could deal with people literally three times his weight. So nobody cross-trained. Nobody cross-practiced. Um, so she is, of course, a judo practitioner. She was my instructor. Um... That's mom. Hi, mom. <laughs> um, so she was a judo instructor as well as a karate practitioner. And she was going to try and put a small digestible amount of judo into a place where other karate strikers could use it, right? And so this this predates uh, UFC. This predates, uh, like I say, a lot of the a lot of this stuff where you see. Folks like uh, Georges Saint Pierre doing doing cross training for other people so that he impresses on folks how much you have to work on your grappling. Uh, what's funny about this is that despite being a brown belt, uh, this is Marcus Wooten. He's one of the most scary people I've met. He grew up to be very very. I say grew up. He's probably in his thirties here. He continued to be very very strong in his later life. Um, he's a very scary martial arts practitioner. He made at least third dawn. Uh, Francis Say, I believe, made at least fifth on, and I haven't talked to him in 15 years either. 
so we tried this with all of our students and the brown belt and one of our more it's functional I think there's a lack of control there but we'll talk about that in a minute um, they did this basically three days worth they did about three days worth of control slow working on these techniques to get them to a point where they could do a seminar and this is their result after three days that's a really good throw that's a really nice sotomaki komi really nice control into the armbar and like i said these are these are experienced karatero people these are people that are used to punching each other hold on hold on i just saw something else cool that i want to i want to talk about right quick these are people that are used to punch kick and not a lot of kick mostly punch mostly boxing style stuff with three days to practice it <laughs> so you know i both want to annihilate them for it and also really hold up how good these guys are so the thing i want to make fun of here is look at the stance he is in this very very elongated stance for the time being and fran has for some reason decided to start his fights in a cat stance with one hand down here like you can't even show it because i've got it down by my waist both of them have this so low like set and that, you know, these days we look at anybody from any style, no matter, even if you want to punch them from back here, you've got this, this loaded up properly. It stays up, right? You're never going to have it lower than that. I, I've got my shoulders up, but you know what I mean? You're never going to have it lower than that. No matter how small you are, no matter how tall you are, you're just going to have it defending something. This is so scary to drop your guard that far. And they're not taking, you know, what's supposed to be a judo setup. They're taking a karatero setup. Just really shows you the difference of 30 years, right? Just nobody in any art would do this anymore. It's not even a mistake. It's just stylistically different. I don't know why we used Koshiguruma for hip throw. Oh, bring your knees together, bring your knees together. He sits real close and then he opens his knee way up. Sorry, I'm much more interested in judo than I am in karatero these days. I do still practice it, but... Uh, but it is... This is far more my passion, right? But as a, as a digestible... Same thing we were talking about before. As a digestible, short... Here's a couple of techniques of judo to get you out of some sticky situations. Sure. So you know, this was, this was an intro. Sorry, let me listen to her for a second. And at a later time require them to learn the finishing techniques. We put in both arm locks and choking moves. And they'll demonstrate each... Yeah, sorry, I, I wanted to, to listen to what the, the overarching thing was saying here. And like I say, these are people that had three days to work on it. Mm. Sayatoshi has a lifting move. I don't know why we're doing, what's that, Sodegoro Mijime? I guess you would call that. It's a very effective one. The choke's really good. I'm very impressed with the choke. I'm not impressed with the throw, but again. Can we get a close up on that? Somebody in their first week, basically. <laughs> I guess their first two weeks of practice. Yeah, his his entry into this choke is really good, and I guess what you get is Sodego Umejime. I guess you could call this a really, really modified Katajime. Yeah, his yeah. Toshi is, a, is an odd choice for somebody that's that tall, but I think they did want to have a shoulder throw, the and that's the best be a strong push or they could do for a shoulder throw on short notice. I guess she didn't want to use Siwainage just because it's harder to try and explain Siwainage to karate people. Okay, so I have a lot to discuss here. Actually, he did it much better. The first one was not good. The second one he did is much better. So there's no defense here. He doesn't make any attempt to stop the guy from punching him in the face. Chest. Doesn't make any attempt to stop the guy from punching him in the chest, which makes me very, very concerned. But I guess you're just hoping that he overreaches. It's very odd. Also, the, the technique they asked for was Yoko Otoshi. The technique that he did is closer to... No, I'll give him credit for Yoko Tosh. You know what? Again, the fact that he's a newer player, I'll give him credit for Yoko Tosh. I do like this technique, but I feel like he's so far away and has no control over the body that this will never work, right? He's very strong, as are all the karate participants of the era. 
everybody in the 80s and 90s was super, super strong physically, even if they don't look like it. But you're trying to do that with all arms. You're not controlling his body. He's just going to run away. Uh, Tsukomijime is an interesting choice as well, because that's also not a choke you generally teach people first. If you have the jacket, you can use that to push cold. Yeah, he's doing a great job with Tsukomijime. The choke one more time, oh, Michael. <laughs> oh, yeah. And she's correct. Poking choke is much, much simpler. Much, much simpler. Uh, but there's no there's no closeness in the body. There's no kind of body control. So you're going to have to do that with your hands and arms. Okay, so here's a classic. Um, Surigurumejime, which is what I called the first choke as well. I guess you could call the first one Ryotejime also. It's hard to be really sure. There's a more classic um, Surigurumejime. The next throw is a very familiar one. A which uh, I, I disagree with the, the uh, clinician. So that you can easily disbalance your opponent. So there, there's an actual block. He actually stopped from being shot in the down. face this first. Directly yeah, and Marcus has done a much better place. job of holding his opponent, Marcus right, preventing his opponent from moving. Opponent from that being said, I would never try to control an opponent with that. Just because it's too easy for him to break, it, right? It's actually it across, easy to for him to get out knee. by breaking his elbow. His He's a, point is to keep his yeah, before he repositioned it, it would have broken his shoulder. Sure but it's actually kind of easy for your opponent to get some control back by just letting you dislocate his fucking elbow. And then he can do things again. <laughs> so I would I would never use this as a long term control. I just use that as a as a way to, to stop the guy from doing anything. And fairly simple. All of the throws we're doing for safety. And Fran won't land on top of Marcus. However, that would be a very simple thing. Yeah, we're gonna to try and be nice in here and not land Fran on him. Obviously you do this in self defense. You land right on the guy's stop. chest and he stops breathing. So um at the time he would have. Now one more time, let me go look at that again. This is this is amazing. This is stuff we were teaching to karate people. He just grabs it. He literally just grabs the hand as it's coming for him. That guy punched you in the chest. <laughs> You have to stop him. That's why we used Mwashiyuke so much at the time of these type of things. You cannot stand there and get punched hoping to grab the guy. That's those those trapping moves we were seeing John do earlier. That's why you need that. Excuse me. That's why you need that sort of thing. He does do a good job with the with the throw. Uh, as he lands, he's in a perfect position. I know Suromaki Komi is sometimes taught as a lifting type of technique. I learned it as a dropping technique. I learned this version of it. Hmm. There's so much on that. And this, I, despite the fact that I have my back turned to my opponent, this is a much better controlling technique because you have the ability to hold it and determine how much pressure you're going to put on there. You have a lot of control as to, am I actually going to dislocate this elbow? Am I just going to sit here? If he's going to reach up for me with his other hand, I don't have to stay there. I can just dislocate his elbow and move out. Much better control. Yep, Koshiguruma. I don't know why they picked Koshiguruma either. I feel like the, the technique choices for learning judo are very, very weird. Usually we would just learn... To be able to, basic um, shoulder throw, throw, basic circle throw for the, the sacrifice. Ogoshi, just basic hip throw. And now again, he's got an arm all the way out. That's okay so for hip throw. Very basic. Okay, once arm again, arm he learned. He must have learned it this way because he sits very close. He's very good at setting up the arm bar. But nowadays, everybody can do this arm bar, and everybody knows you gotta you gotta sit real close. You gotta keep your knees together. You gotta keep your core together because that's what's actually doing the break right so as a demonstration of what the technique is this is fine but this does not hold up at all even though i think this is one of the best techniques that they do yeah you absolutely have to keep your knees together but this is like i said i think he does quite well at that technique tournaments but it is a very simple to do Reverse throw, uranage. I remember what I wanted to argue about this. I, I watched this and I forgot what I wanted to argue. Okay. I remember why they use Koshigurume. I remember why they use Koshigurume because they're setting up for this throw. This is not uranage. Uranage is a belly to back suplex, basically. This is not a backwards throw or reverse throw. This is a hand wheel. This is uh, Teguruma. I would love to see that again. 
way. Yeah, I was going to say, I'd, I'd love to see that one again. Um, I remember what I was going to yell about this. If this, this technique is very, very misnamed, right? So he's just going to go down, pick him up by his leg and his, his collar. Just grab him by the knee, pick him up, and roll him over. Bang. That's really good control on that. And uh, this this was used under the name Tegaroma for, for years and years and years until uh, uh, until we got rid of all the leg grabs after the 2008 Olympics. So maybe 2010, I think we banned leg grabs. Uh, so you wouldn't see anybody practice this anymore. But until then, we called it, I want to say Tegaroma, hand wheel. Um, we don't don't uh, teach it directly anymore, but of course it's still in the 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 history of judo, and so you'll see it sometimes in the in the background history of judo. It would be very simple for Fran to simply go down with him, driving him into the ground. Yeah, neat. I don't know. I, I I'm very of two minds here because this is definitely the early early group of cross training, right? It's people that were doing. Grappling when that was never done by strikers, right? Nobody ever did. Thirty-one new Okay, so we talked a little bit about the fact that we were trying to use other. Oh, yeah. You see, now that he has a stick that's long enough, he can control it better. He's putting way more focus on his attacks. He's finishing his attacks. The stances are still a little questionable, but they even those seem to have improved a little bit. I think he, they were just afraid to do too much dynamic stuff while they were holding the big stick. Because we did a lot of that outside, right? You you didn't really want to do that inside, where you would hit things. But at the same time, you, since we're recording, you know, <laughs> doing that outside sucks. Uh, these sort of things were developed sort of taking the existing stuff that, that was out there for a short stick, for, for Joe, for like three foot, four foot stick, and trying to formalize it into something you could make a little more sense out of. Just sort of in the idea that you would never really have something of bow length these days unless you were a farmer. If you happen to get yourself in trouble and need a weapon right quick, Wow, you hear that dynamic. It's both his breathing and his the focus as his, his gi like snaps on his That's very 80s and 90s. We don't do that anymore. Everything goes through more, you know, more dynamic kind of movement, more flowing type of movement. And not so much into that like It sounds like a movie. <laughs> Sounds like the effects that they add to those like kung fu movies that you would watch in the 80s and 90s. Uh, but anyway, so this this the, you know the idea behind this stuff was was sort of the early idea that you wouldn't have a rake, you wouldn't have a, a, a broom, you're not going to have a hoe, you're not going to have a garden equipment that's six feet long. You're going to have a walking stick maybe, right? So it's it's the effective use of smaller. smaller things or any particular piece of wood or stick you can pick up and use that to clobber somebody and he did as a matter of fact the the instructor that you're seeing there the guy that was doing that and uh okay. is doing the bits with the stick here uh he did walk with a walking stick actually he has a very bad left leg which you don't see while he's practicing because he doesn't want you to and when they say karate people are scary, they are not kidding. Every one of these people. Uh, I would say Pam is less scary than everyone else. Partially due to being significantly smaller and female. But even she could really mess you up very quickly if she needed to. She just doesn't do it all the time. Whereas a lot of these guys, maybe not Tom so much. Tom seemed fairly gentle to me. But everybody else in this video was... <laughs> scary, intimidating, let's go drink in the bar and cause problems. You know, they were they were scary people and they were really, really crazy stories that you hear about karate people from the nineties were at least partially true. And yeah, a lot of these look kind of convoluted, but if you take all of them together, right? If you take all of them joined as one set of defenses it kind of covers all the ways anybody can approach you, right? I've got my stick in my hand. He's either going to grab me, punch me, or grab my arm. 
right? There's, it's hard to approach me without doing one of those things. Which is a nice way of saying, look, I don't have to make the first move. And that's, that's, that's definitely a big thing in self-defense. I am very capable of standing here and waiting for you to make it very clear that we're in a fight. Ugh, please don't hit him in the head. I don't have to be the one that starts the fight, right? As a matter of fact, I'm trying very hard not to be in a fight. When you make it very clear we're going to be in a fight, that's when we're going to be in a fight. And that includes Paul. Uh, Paul Sensei is a very nice guy and also extremely scary. I think this is after at least one hip replacement, too. So he's got that same... Look at his stances! His stances look way better. Maybe not when he's kicking, but you know what I mean? When he lands two feet in a stance... Yeah, that's a stance. He's not on top of the ground. He's in the ground. Yeah. His look, much more impressive. Although, he had more... <laughs> that's definitely me. Look at, look at me being a dumb old dumbo. Look at me messing around in the back. Yeah, no, his, his look's way more impressive. Okay, we're all the way through the end of this. Man! Man, this is different than... Uh, does it give the logo? It gives the logo. There's the logo. This is way different than karate people I see these days. It's not to say that anything is wrong. It's to say that more different parts of different aspects of Taekwondo, of Judo and Jiu-Jitsu, of uh, other striking arts, uh, you know, of even people that come in from Hapkido, people that come in from, um, you know, just traditional wrestling have brought so much to what modern Karatero is that this looks out of place. It feels weird to see people doing only things that came from karate. And I, you know, like I say, I don't want to, I don't want to shit on them. They were, they were doing great things. And as a matter of fact, this was one of the early times where people were trying to get different things, things from Kobudo mostly, but also some judo and also some uh, sparring related techniques like these, this trapping kata that John was doing. Um, and try and get different aspects out to say that, look, your karate is not just punch, 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 right? Your karate has other aspects to it. Um, it's, it looks very weird now to look back 30 years and look how limited this looks and compare that to where we are now and compare that to, you know, the things you're going to find in dojos these days and the things that you find going into the octagon these days are so much more complete and so much more well-rounded and have different sets of focuses that I just love this. I think this is amazing to me. I think these folks were doing a really good job. They were doing something really good. And it's a lead up to where we are now, but it looks so out of place going back and looking at it. I hope anybody else had as much fun with this as I did. Um, this was really fun to me. And mostly I just wanted to bitch about the judo, but I, I also am, uh, am looking back at this very fondly. Trying to learn some stuff that I, that I didn't pay attention to when I was 7 to 15 or however long I, I was working out with this group of people. Um, if you have any other weird martial arts related things, preferably in somewhere near karate -do and judo. Uh, I'm not really interested in doing other jujitsu stuff. I'm certainly not interested in commentating over Brazilian stuff. Not that I don't know anything about it, but I would prefer to work out with those people. I don't really know too much about their mindset. And I know that's a lot of what I'm going to encounter on the, the internet these days is Brazilian practitioners, but... Uh, I don't have the the depth of knowledge there, but I'll certainly talk about it. Uh, please don't send me MMA clips. I don't really want to deal with MMA clips. I'll deal with some other stuff, but I, I don't really care too much for prize fighting. Uh, but like other other tournament clips and stuff would be great. Let's be silly with martial arts on the internet. I appreciate it. Hope anybody else had fun with this. Have a good night, y'all.